Wow, it's good to see everyone. God bless you all. First, I want to say thank you to Pastor Paul and Pastor Ainsley for allowing me to come up and speak. It's an honor to be here and be part of this church and all of you amazing people. You all have been so gracious and kind to me in many situations, especially I was supposed to speak back in April, but um, my husband had passed away April 1st. So Pastor uh, switched it, gave me a little bit of time, and God has really been working on me uh, in these last few months and has kept me very, very busy. So I'm so grateful to God, even in trials and tribulations, he still will show his love and mercy to us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for today. I just ask a blessing on this service. Less of me, Lord, and more of you. Use me as a vessel and a light for your son, Jesus Christ. As I share the word, Lord, let people's hearts and minds be open, that they take this word and apply it to their life, that each person they hear about that I talk about today, Lord, that they can identify with. We love you, Lord. We thank you for the live stream audience and the blessings that you have for them, too. Thank you, God, for Pastor Paul and Pastor Ainsley. Bless their trip their rest, their relaxation. Let them get recharged and be blessed in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. So the title of the message is More Than What's Required. Uh, Like all of you, I sit on my same spot every week and or I'm online watching and I saw our sign in the background that was right here, our theme for the year, Go the Extra Mile. And it reminds me of people in the Bible that have gone that extra mile, those that didn't give up and pursued what needed to be done. Before God called me into ministry, I had my own business. I traveled and spoke at large meetings and conventions. Our teams grew uh, here in the States and then internationally. I have always believed in the Lord, and my thought was I was meant to fund the kingdom and to help people and help the church. And that's pretty much what I did. I, I love that. I'd volunteer and stuff, but I love doing the fundraisers and organizing and helping. One of my favorite organizations to support at that time was a missions project in Brazil called the Moore Project, and it was led by Sergio Ponce. Once my business took off, that was one of the main projects that I supported besides my own local church. So let me tell you a little bit about this Moore Project. Sergio Ponce was a dentist who gave up his practice to help save the children in Brazil that lived in the favelas. So in the favelas, the kids are used for sex trafficking. uh, They're used for drug trafficking. They're entered into gangs at a young age. And the drug lords control the area. I remember when our team went out there to support the Moore Project, they had to pull us all back because someone, one of the drug lords, put tires in the middle of the area and put someone in it and lit it on fire to say, you know, they're ruling this area. In fact, Sergio Ponce went in front of some drug lords while they had AK-47s pointed at his head, and, sa- and he said, I'm not leaving this place without this young man. So he stood his ground, and as you can see, Sergio went the extra mile for his organization. I thought it was great because I was funding the kingdom and helping, but here he is doing all the work. Then one day the Lord spoke to me through a personal situation I was going through. He was asking me to let everything go and to serve him, but like Jonah, who left to Tarshish, I left to Thailand. The personal situation was too much, and I could not see myself doing what the Lord had asked me to do because I kind of felt people betrayed me, and he asked me to do it. I need you to serve me. But at that point, I was a little selfish in my mind, and I didn't care. I was like, no, I'm leaving. I'm tired of all this. It's almost like I'm tired of doing all this good work, and you're not hearing me, God. So I was like a little kid and threw a temper tantrum, kind of like Jonah. This is what happened in Thailand. So imagine... I left to Thailand, which was an unusual thing for me to do. I never liked traveling, and I called my best friend, Denise Sincox, and I said, "Uh, we're going to Thailand, tell your husband. I already got our tickets, and we're on our way. And she said, okay, 
Well, her husband, he's a good man and he knows me, he let her go. But when we went, we went during a time where there was curfew, there was rioting going on, and you were not supposed to be out in the street after a certain time. But my attitude of, I don't care, we're going. After 25 hours plus flights, stopping in Japan, I didn't sleep the whole time. I was wide awake, still being stubborn. While we get there, we're the only ones on the road headed to the hotel. God was with us. We didn't get in trouble. But the next day, our tour started. And I'm going to show you some images. So they took us, and, and we spoke in, a, in big, large groups. Uh, we went to different locations, and they took me around to see the sites, all their gods, the reclining Buddha, the big Buddha that's all of gold. And uh, me and Denise even got in trouble at uh, <laughs> the, the beautiful place where the palace was because we were jumping around and the guards came over and yelled at us. Well, when God uses you and he wants you to do something, he's kind of putting people in your path. So even every person, especially Kuhn, one of the ladies, she was a Christian. And she was a Christian in Thailand. And she said, I know you're a Christian because I see you, I follow you. So she literally starts bringing more Christians around me. And I go, I see you, God. I know what you're trying to do. My answer is still no. When I got home, I felt the tugging at me again to go to this special women's conference where he wanted me to seek him. And I still said no. All my friends were calling me, but seven of them in a row called. The last woman that called me I felt guilty because I couldn't say no to her because just months before she called me and said, do you know someone that can help me? My husband is sick. He's in the hospital and he doesn't know Jesus and he could die. And I was the one that orchestrated sending a pastor over there that could relate to him because he was a biker. So I sent this pastor, Pastor Tom from Bikers for Christ over there and he was saved. Pastor Tom was good like that. Didn't matter who he was talking to, you were getting saved. I don't know if it was his look or what. But I felt guilty. So I was like, mm, okay, I'll show up. And I heard God specifically say that in, in the church service that it was important that I follow him. If I loved him, why wouldn't I go to church by myself? If I loved him, why wouldn't I spend time with him by myself? So the next day, I heard him, and I went to church by myself, and he spoke to me again regarding ministry school. This call wouldn't be easy. As you can see, I had 50,000 people in my business all across the world, and I was going to have to give all of that up, and I was going to have to tell them. And everybody that I did tell was very surprised. But God got me through ministry school. Trust me, I don't like studying. It's not my favorite thing. Anybody else? Not really. Uh, it's not a favorite thing. Well, I gave up my business to serve the Lord, and he still continues today to bless me. He's never left me. Even when I acted like a spoiled brat, he still loved me, and he didn't forget me. So no matter what, when we put the Lord first, he will handle every situation. You know, I told you, you know, my husband died. He's handling all that situation. I have to trust him. I have to be able to share the word because that's what he's required me to do. So I wanted to share with you some stories from the Bible about amazing people that went the extra mile. These stories will tell you about people who had hopes and dreams, doubts, fears. They had ambition. They wanted to attach their self to a movement or a cause. They were reliable. They arrived early. And they really wanted people to take notice. Yes. So let's look at the first point, Abram in Genesis 14, 16. But let me give you a little backstory of the scripture. The kings made war in the valley of Siddim. That is the salt sea 
and it was full of asphalt pits. In Long Beach, we call that potholes. And King Sodom and King Gomorrah fled. And some people died in battle there, and some fled to the mountains. The other kings took everything, and Lot, and his family too. But someone escaped and told Abram, and it was on. And why I mean it was on, it was on like Donkey Kong. Yeah. He armed 318 trained servants. So the verse says, so he brought back all the goods and also brought back his brother Lot and his goods as well as the women and the people. He divided his forces against them by night. Abram had a military wisdom using the clever tactic of a night attack with his army split into two groups. He succeeded in rescuing Lot and recovering all the goods. Seized by the partners of those four kings, Abram does more than what is required for his family and for others that were with him. We may see our story in this ancient account of Abram's rescue of Lot. We were those often sin and shame, rescued by one, Jesus, who left his safety and happiness for us. Our Redeemer Jesus went to great trouble, and with his courage and daring, he defeated the mighty enemy that had put us in bondage, and he took all the enemy's spoil. Amen? Amen. Point two, the three wise men, the Magi, in Matthew 2, 1 to 2. Let's look at that scripture. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. On today's map, Babylon would be pretty close to Baghdad, Iraq, which means the Magi would have traveled more than 900 miles to meet Jesus. By that time, they go to Jerusalem. They were looking for a child, not a baby, which implies that they had been traveling for a long time. Remember, there was no fast track road. There wasn't Tesla at that time. There was not even a plane. This was during Herod's kingship. They asked around, where can we find and pay homage to the newborn king of the Jews? We observe a star in the eastern sky that signaled his birth. We are here to give honor to this king. So they show up at Bethlehem. Bethlehem was an ancestral home of David, the king of Israel, and the founder of their royal dynasty. However, it was not a large town. It was a little town. Bethlehem was a little town, six miles to the south of Jerusalem. In the days of Herod the king, this was the one known as Herod the Great. Because when you look at the Bible, you're going to see multiple Herods. Herod was indeed great, in some ways, great as a ruler, a builder, an administrator. In other ways, great in politics, and he was very good at cruelty. He was wealthy, politically gifted, and clever enough to remain in the good graces of the Roman emperors. So these wise men from the east, these travelers, are called wise men. Why are they called wise men? Because it means astronomer. They were legendary. They came to Jerusalem. They expected that the leaders of the people of the capital city of the Jews would be even more interested than they were. These are people that came 900 miles away to see the newborn king. They asked, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? They traveled this great distance to honor a king. So no more complaining if you're driving from Long Beach, you're driving from another part of Orange County, 
come in from San Bernardino. You know, don't complain anymore because these guys traveled far. Yes. Notice it was his star, capital H-I-S, capital S-T-A-R, in the east. The star was Christ's star, and it led others to Christ. It led them there. Remember, they said, we have come to worship him. The wise men came first to Jerusalem, assuming the leaders of the Jews would be aware and excited about the birth of the Messiah. But we know the wise men were about to find out that that wasn't the case at all. These men could have realized that they were getting themselves into a world of trouble. But they didn't worry about it. They kept going. They did more than what was required. Sometimes we're put in situations where it's uncomfortable, but we have to push through. And they saw it. But look it. They were led straight to Christ. Point three, the friends of a paralyzed man, Mark 2, 3 to 5. Then they came to him bringing a paralegic who was crucified, I'm sorry, who was carried, whew, wrong subject, who was carried by four men. And when they could not come near, they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So just imagine there's a hole being cut through our roof. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralegic was lying. Think about those men that went that extra mile just to climb the roof. I mean, I know I would not want to climb the roof. I'd be like, no, but I guess we'll wait out here until he walks out. Think about this. When Jesus saw their faith, Jesus looked up at the four men struggling with the ropes tied to each corner of the stretcher of the paralegic man's, trying to put him down. He looked at them and he saw their faith. Yes. Yes. Their faith could be seen. This bold determination, this action to bring their friend to Jesus proved their faith. Do we even drive our friends to church? Do we go that extra mile? That's important. When Jesus said, son, your sins are forgiven you, we can, could just imagine his friends looking through that little people. They went to a lot of trouble to see their friend get healed from this paralysis. And now the teacher only wants to forgive them. We might imagine them shouting, no, he's paralyzed. He needs to be healed first before he's forgiven. But Jesus knew what the man's real need was. Yes. And, the, and what his greatest need was, was forgiveness. Yes, what good was it if this man had two legs and walked right into hell? That would not be good. Whenever there was a problem... Almost always, sin is the real problem. Jesus got right to the problem. Jesus did not mean that the paralyzed man was sinful or that his paralysis was directly caused by sin. Instead, he addressed the man's greatest need and the common root of all pain and suffering, man's sinful condition. Forgiveness is the greatest miracle that Jesus ever performed. We heard that he raised people from the dead, that he healed the blind, that he got people's demons out of them. But the real miracle is Jesus' forgiveness for us. It meets the greatest need. It costs the greatest price. And it brings the greatest blessing and the most lasting result. Thank God for those friends that do more than what is required. Yes. I mean, I don't know about you, but I have friends like that. Many of them. But I want to say especially David and Melissa Brunig, because when I called them in this tragedy, they came. I don't know. God must have just moved them from one place to another because within seconds it seemed like they were there. 
So let's look at point four. Zacchaeus in Luke 19, 1, 10. Then Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. Now behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector and he was rich. And he sought to see who's Jesus, who Jesus was, but could not because of the crowd, for he was short in statute. So he was a smaller guy. So he ran ahead and climbed up into the sycamore tree to see him, for he was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste, come down, for today I must stay at your house. So he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. But when they saw it, they all complained, saying, He has gone to be with a guest, be a guest with a man who is a sinner? Then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, I give half of my goods to the poor. And if I have taken anything from anyone, By false accusation, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Jericho was an ancient city, And as Jesus passed through the city on his way to Jerusalem, it seemed that the reason he was going there was for Zacchaeus. And remember, this man was a tax collector. And not only a tax collector, but the chief tax collector. And the Jews hated him. This was not only due to their natural dislike of taxes, like most of us, Nobody likes tax day, right? But more so because of the practice known as tax farming. The collector made his profit on whatever extra he could get away with by charging his victims. A tax collector was highly motivated to make the taxes as high as possible. He went the extra mile in a different way before he met Jesus. But now we see him go the other way, the other extra mile, now that he knows Jesus. Zacchaeus wanted to set his eyes on Jesus. He longed to see this remarkable man, Jesus, for himself. He was short, remember? It probably affected his personality. Probably didn't like people making fun of him. We could imagine they mocked him. uh, They hated him on top of it. And he decided... I'll return the favor by charging you more. So that's how he got his victims. Because Zacchaeus worked hard at risking the embarrassment to see Jesus, Jesus saw him and did not pass him by. So here he was, this tax collector, and everybody knew who he was. They were probably all, don't talk to that guy, Jesus. He's horrible. How many people have been horrible. And you've been horrible, but Jesus still, amen, back there, but Jesus still wanted you. He still loved you. He didn't care. Remember, Jesus sees you even when you're at your worst, but he still loves you. In the best sense, Zacchaeus stood out to Jesus and Jesus connected with him. Jesus told Zacchaeus, to hurry and come down. If he did not hurry, the opportunity might be lost. If he did not lower himself, he would never meet Jesus. And this tells us that we need to come down from our high place too. Might be your religion, your job, your success. Jesus would never have eaten with Zacchaeus if he stayed in the sycamore tree. So think about that. Same with me. If I would have just stayed in my business and ignored what God was telling me, I would have never have been where I'm at today. And I'm the most happiest I've ever been. 
by loving the Lord. Jesus would only come in the house of Zacchaeus and into his life if he was invited. You have to invite Jesus into your heart. He's a gentleman. He's not going to just push his way in. He's not going to force you to love him. So if there's anyone online, too, that hasn't asked Jesus into their heart, all you have to do is say, I love you. I want you. Come into my life. And he'd be happy to. He receives Jesus first and then started a relationship with him. Jesus shows us that's how you do more than what is required. Now let's look at point five, John the Baptist. John the Baptist, the forerunner of the word. John 1, 6 to 8. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness, to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. He was not the light, but was sent to bear witness of the light. John the Baptist bore the witness of the light that all through him might believe. The work of John the Baptist was deliberately focused on bringing people to the faith in Jesus the Messiah. He definitely went the extra mile because I don't think any of us want to go eat locusts or honey in the wilderness. Yeah, it doesn't look fun. The matter of the witness is a serious thing. Establishing truth and giving ground to faith. Yet witness does more. It commits a man. If I take a stand in the witness box and testify that such and such is the truth of the matter, I am no longer natural. I have committed myself. This scripture lets us know that there are those like John the Baptist who have committed their self by their witness to Christ. When I think of John the Baptist, I think of my boss, Mr. Richard. He's 91 years old, and all he cares about is how many people have come to Christ. That's it. That's all he ever asks. He's the best boss to work for because all he cares about is Jesus. How many people did you disciple? How many people have you baptized? He's excited to hear those stories at 91 years old. And he's a successful businessman. You know, he, he doesn't have to work, but he loves going to work. He loves participating and helping other people. Point six, let's look at Mary. And some of you are Mary. I know quite a few of you. If I, if I thought of someone you reminded me of, it would be Mary. John 12, 3, 8. Then Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard, anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who betrayed him, said, Why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box. And he used to take what was part was, was put in it. So he was kind of like his own little tax collector. I'd take a little bit off the top. But Jesus said, let her alone. She has kept this for the day of my burial. For the poor you have with you always, but me you do not have always. Mary took this pound of very costly oil and anointed the feet of Jesus. In the midst of supper, Mary gave a remarkable gift. And she didn't just go to Costco, Walmart, the nearest 7-Eleven. Mm -mm. It wasn't unusual to wash the feet of a guest, but it was unusual to do it during the meal itself. To use very costly oil, a spicknard, to do it, and to wipe the feet with her hair. Her hair, using the hair as kind of a towel. Mary's gift was definitely more than what was required. 
When a guest entered the home, usually the guest's feet were washed with water and the guest's head was anointed with a dab of oil or perfume. Here, Mary uses this precious ointment and anointed the feet of Jesus. This means that she let down her hair in public. Sometimes that would never, actually, probably most of the time, that would never happen back in those days. But she didn't care what others thought of her. She did not care. She pulled her hair down, and the house was filled with this fragrance. The sense of the smell makes for long-lasting memories, and John remembered how Mary's essential oils made the whole house smell good. Some of you might have a memory of a loved one that has gone on to heaven, but you can still smell their perfume or the soap they used, or maybe if it was a man, their work clothes. Anybody ever smell someone and just have a memory of someone like that? Then Judas broke the embarrassed silence with his sharp sense of financial values, but no appreciation of what God, God's value was. He thought this was too much love and devotion to show Jesus. We need to be careful not to do that. Sometimes we feel that about tithing or serving or helping. So we have to be careful. He is going the extra mile in the wrong direction. But I love Jesus. Jesus said, let her alone. You could just imagine him just straightening that out right away. If we are extreme in our love for Jesus... He will not criticize us like he did Judas. It is better to be like Mary, extreme in our love for Jesus, than to be like Judas, criticizing others who show such great love for Jesus. Jesus said, She has done this for the day of my burial. In the same way, that would be rude if we loudly object to a funeral Thing, you know, someone's funeral expenses. It would have been like if somebody complained about something, about a person's funeral. That would be horrible, right? Well, who are you out there? Are you Mary? You've only gone through six points, and we're almost to the seven, and I haven't put you to sleep yet, so that's good. <laughs> but I like to read the Word. I think it's exciting on how all these examples will show us who we are, how we can apply our lives, Who are we acting like? Are we being a Judas or are we being a Mary? Now let's look at the seventh point here. The Shumanite woman in 2 Kings 4, 18 to 24. This is actually one of my favorite scriptures. Remember I said I went to that women's conference and there was a female pastor from New York and she actually spoke on this. And it stood with me because I never really understood this scripture until she read it, and it was God talking to me. Pay attention. I have something for you. Let me give you a little backstory on the Shumanite woman. In the times of Elisha, he would go through the town of Shunem, where there was a noble woman, we would say famous or an important woman. She even told her husband, this is a holy man who passes through regularly. She would show hospitality to Elijah and his helper, Gehazi. They would eat at her house, and she even gave them their own room. So they had their own place to sleep and relax. All this time, she never asked for anything, and Elijah noticed. He also noticed that she had no children, so he told her she would have a son. She even said to him, no, don't joke. This is, I'm paraphrasing. Don't play with my emotions. You could have just imagined, you know, all those years not having a child, and then all of a sudden you're told you're going to have a child. But she did give birth to a son, and he grew and was out in the field with the father when tragedy happened. So let's read the story, 2 Kings 4, 18 to 24. And the child grew, 
Now it happened one day that he went out to his father, to the reapers. And he said to his father, my head, my head. So he said to his servant, carry him to his mother. So when he had taken him and brought him to his mother, he sat on her knee till noon, and then he died. And she went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God, shut the door upon him and went out. Then she called to her husband and said, please send me one of the young men and one of the donkeys that I may run to the man of God and come back. So he said, why are you going to him? It is neither the new moon nor the Sabbath. And she said, it is well. Then she saddled the donkey and said to her servant, drive and go forward. Do not slacken the pace for me unless I tell you. You notice she tells her husband, it's okay, I'll be right back. She never says, our son is dead. She puts the little boy on the holy man's bed, the bed that she provided for him. Can you imagine your only child? What kind of faith did this woman have? This was the son granted by a miraculous promise in reward to the faithful service of this Shumanite woman. The boy tragically died on the lap of his mother after a brief but severe affliction. It was probably a sunstroke. She went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God, shut the door upon him, and went out. This shows the faith of the woman. She prepared for the resurrection of the boy, not his burial. The Shumanite woman didn't want Elijah to learn of her grief through his assistant, Gehazi. She wanted the man of God to hear it from her own lips and senses her own grief. You know, sometimes I was in these situations where I wanted to tell somebody that my husband died. I didn't want somebody else to tell them. I wanted to explain my feelings, my thoughts. And this is what she's doing. Elijah said, let her alone. Kind of like what Jesus said, right, with Mary. For her soul is in deep distress, and the Lord has hindered it from me and has not told me. So he didn't know until she came to him. Elijah seemed mystified that the woman who he presumably oftenly prayed for was in a crisis that was hidden from him. But she refused to leave him. I will not leave you. She's not loitering. She's not gossiping. She's not telling everybody her problems. She's not. She's going right to the source. I need your help. I'm not leaving without you. She's determined. And he did go. And he went into the room and shut the door behind the two of them. And he prayed to the Lord. God did heal the Shumanite woman's son in the response to Elijah's prayer. He prayed after the pattern shown by his mentor, Elijah, in 1 King 17, 20 to 23. So you could take that note down. Elijah prayed with great faith because he knew God worked this way in the life of his mentor. I had mentors. Pastor Tom, um, when I was in ministry school, he's the one that encouraged me, wrote my first letter to be ordained. Pastor Tom from Bikers for Christ, I'd call him and say, I don't know what's happening and why God's using me. I don't understand it. He'd encourage me. Pastor Al taught me about the gifts of the Spirit. Each gift, he was tough. He did not let me slack. Uh, pastor Tony Dunn, who is now Bishop Tony Dunn, he's an amazing pastor. He has his church in Corona, New Day, and then New Day International. And he is across the world now. And he was one of my mentors, but him too. He gave it to me straight. 
So a mentor is important in our life. And of course, Pastor Paul and Pastor Ainsley, who just love me. I just, I, they're amazing. Because a lot of times you go to church. This is a great church, I have to say, if you're visiting. You go to church and you, the pastors don't even talk to you. You know, you walk out the door and that's it. But Pastor Paul and Pastor Ainsley will call you on the phone. How are you doing? Making sure you're okay. He also prayed with great faith because he sensed that God wanted to raise this boy from the dead. Elijah and Elisha rightly begged God to raise the dead. Jesus commanded the dead to be raised. Great news here, though. The flesh of the child became warm. Then the child sneezed seven times, and the child opened his eyes. Although miracles were for the most part done in an instant, yet sometimes they were done by degrees. I'm here in the flesh today to tell you all, you are uh, amazing. You are seed on good soil. Don't get discouraged. Keep going. You will prevail. Always remember there are different kinds of people you will be speaking to. Remember, there's no limits when you're the, in the inner circle of Jesus. Remember, Jesus took his disciples with him. He brought them with him to watch. He took them aside to learn. And he sent them out to do. Do you realize all along he had been training you up for ministry? Jesus taught through stories and parables, and he reminds us to take up our cross daily and trust him. And when I say he's been training us up all along and we just didn't notice it, remember I told you about that man from Bikers for Christ, and I told you I'd love to do fundraisers, and we would raise money for Totally Kids Hospital in Loma Linda every year, started in 2004. And there was a man there and I walked in because it's from age newborn to 21. And most of these kids have trachs, brain damage. It's, you go there, you're gonna, your heart's going to be crying. And there was a man, and he's laying in the bed. And he, you could tell he's a gangster, tattoos, stuff like that. But he was young. And I went immediately outside to the guys that were the biker pastors and said, can you come in and pray for this man? I feel like, I feel like he needs prayer. They come in, and this is, normally wouldn't happen. They pull the shade around us, and Pastor says, Pastor Martin said to me, Doreen, you pray. You're the ones that brought us here. And I'm like, I don't know how to do that. That's not my job. That's yours. You're the pastor. And as I started to pray for him and told him he was forgiven by Jesus, he was pretty much in a coma. Tears came from his eyes. And I never forgot that. But then later on, when I talked to Pastor Martin, another pastor, he says, that's when your ministry started. Do you remember? I didn't even realize it. So you're going to remember that day you spoke to somebody about Jesus Christ is when, that's when your ministry started, when you guided them. It will be uncomfortable. I've got to tell you that because I was. <laughs> Don't let excuses get in the way. People will ask you silly questions. Trust me, I've heard them all. Jesus went all the way for us to the cross he would lay down his life for you and me. There are many superheroes in the Bible. I'm asking you this week to pick up the book of Acts. Read about those superheroes. Peter, Paul, John, Barnabas, Stephen, Philip, and more. And let's go the extra mile. Let's do what's more than required. In Jesus' name. Amen. I want to thank you for joining us today at Hope Chapel Huntington Beach. It's our desire to bring the teachings of this church to others globally. 
If today's message has brought you closer to Jesus, we want to know. Can you send us an email to office at hopechapelhb.org? Would you consider supporting this ministry financially? You can give securely online at hopechapelhb.org slash give. If a check is your preferred method, you can send a mailed check to Hope Chapel, P.O. Box 548, Huntington Beach, California, 92648. If you want to be contacted by Hope Chapel, would you consider subscribing to our weekly newsletters at hopechapelhb.org slash subscribe. Whatever season of life you're in, we want to go through it with you. We want to thank you once again for joining us, and God bless you.